Hello again, audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and today we are going to talk about the RAL requisite HSA 1B, call it all in one amplifier. So again, the usual housekeeping notes, if you like what I am doing on this channel, please like and subscribe to the channel and be on the lookout for how to support me going forward so that I can continue to bring you cool content like this. All right, the RAL requisite HSA-1B. What is it? Now, it is essentially an all-in-one speaker and headphone amplifier. Okay, so it... I guess is technically a speaker amp that they have put headphone taps on up front here so that you can also use it as a high quality headphone amplifier. Now, this was sent to me by the same person who sent me the RAL SR1A um, earfield speaker monitor headphone contraption thing, which I have reviewed and I will link to down in the description below. And so this is the matching amp to that. And I believe that um, headset and this uh, amplifier together as a package deal, if memory serves, goes for $9,000 US dollars from RAL's website. If you're looking to buy just this amp though, it normally lists at $4,500 US dollars, but I just looked it up to uh, verify that. And so I'm going to post this video a little bit ahead of schedule because this is on sale during the month of November, 2021 for 3750 US dollars. That's 3,750 US dollars. So it is November 5th today. And so I will post this a little bit earlier so that you can see this. And if you want to take advantage of that sale, you can click on over there. I'll put a link in the description and you can take a look at this amp there for that reduced sale price. Okay, so then let's talk about the build and the features of the amp itself. So I have it propped up here so that we can see it. And so we will just start with the front panel and talk about everything that's going on here. So for one thing, you can see already it is not full rack width, okay? Uh, it's about half rack width, if that matters. And then there is heat sinking right here on just the one side. So it probably should go on the left side of a rack if you're gonna use a half rack mount for it, okay? Um, but yeah, we have this rocker switch for power right here that nights, lights up a nice orange when it's powered on. And then we have um, these three switches right here. And so what these do is this, again, this amp is designed to work with low impedance loads, okay? It is rated, on the, according to their website anyway, it's rated safe down to 0.3 uh, ohm loads, which is very low, okay? So what this switch does right here is it toggles between a... Um, the, uh, uh, an EQ circuit, actually. So again, it's matching to their SR1A uh, headset, which is a ribbon model, and it's very light in the sub bass. But this switch right here, when it's in the SR1A position, introduces a bass shelf. Okay? So it is in an EQ switch. It attenuates the mids and the highs so that there is more relative bass presence for, the, um, for those ribbon headphones. You Switch that down to the HP or headphone right there, and it takes the, the EQ circuitry out of it. Here what we have is a toggle switch between the headphone outputs and the speaker outputs. And I'll show you the speaker outputs, which are on the back here in just a moment. And then you can toggle here between the balanced XLR. It has three pin balanced XLR input and uh, the RCA single ended stereo input there with this switch. All right, then below those, we have a male four pin XLR output, and this is matched to the, um, uh, the SR1A headset because it has a female four pin XLR plug on it for its cabling. And so this is matched to that. Then we have conventional headphone outputs with the female four pin XLR for balanced and then single ended quarter inch or 6.35 millimeter um, TRS connections right there. Now, something interesting about these outputs is like you can actually still use this output right here with a more conventional headphone uh, setup. And that is because RAL very thoughtfully ships this adapter cable with it, which is um, 
four pin female XLR on both ends and it's only about a foot or so long. Okay, and so what this allows you to do is plug one end into this male output right there and then the other end can accept the male four pin XLR plug from just about any other headphone cable. All right, and that can be important because functionally, these two over here are kind of like low gain outputs and this one right here is more of a high gain output. So there's no gain switch, but by selecting which output you use, you do get some level of gain control um, because, because of the different outputs. All right, so even though this one is labeled ribbon, like I used this to power a lot of hard to drive top of the line headphones. Um, including the Susvara, the Abyss 1266TC, uh, the HE1000 V2. Um, it, anyway, it works fine for all of those. Oh, a HE6 SE V2, okay, works fine for all of those to use this output, all right? Um, and in fact, this was the amp that I used for all of those top-of-the-line headphone reviews that I have done lately, um, and so this was the amp that was you know, doing most of the work for those reviews, just FYI. Okay, then we have a 24-step attenuator right here for the volume control. So it is a stepped attenuator. I think the microphone will pick this up. Okay, so there is some clickiness in there. All right, um, on the volume control. All right, it does seem to be a pretty nice stepped attenuator. I did not notice any channel imbalance, you know, towards the lower ends or even the higher ends or anything like that. So pretty good stuff there. Okay, I promised to show the back panel. So let me turn this around. Okay, I'm just covering up the serial number right here. So don't worry about that. But we have, you know, your standard power plug right here. Pretty common stuff there. I forget what this is called, but I know there's a name for it, but it's standard fare. Okay, single-ended RCA inputs, then the three-pin balanced XLR inputs, which there was the toggle switch for on the front. And then we have our speaker terminals right there. And now these speaker terminals are not binding posts. They are just jacks for banana plugs. That's really the only speaker connection that we'll use. So if you like bare wire or those U-shaped fork things, I forget what they're called. Anyway, um, sorry, you're just going to have to use banana plugs on this one, right? Um, and so, yeah. Now, um, other things that I need to talk about here from a features uh, standpoint. Looking real quick, um, the power output on this. So if you are driving speakers, it will put out a 40 watt per channel um, output at two ohms. And then for every doubling of impedance there, we have a halving of power. So it's rated at 20 watts per channel at four ohms. And it is rated at 10 watts per channel at eight ohms. All right. So you can again use this as an all-in-one um, option to drive speakers and a ribbon headphone if you have it and a conventional headphone be it planar or dynamic if you have that too okay can handle all of that in one box okay now as far as the performance and all of that goes okay um one thing that i do notice here is that the noise floor is a little bit high with some sensitive headphones like Focals, like the Utopia, when I plug this in here, or my Radiance, okay? Um, and I think I heard this on my uh, Fostex TH900 Lutton as well. Um, there is a little bit of a buzz, even from the, the quote, low gain outputs on there, uh, just a low level noise going on. So there is a bit of a noise floor. If you plug one of those sensitive ones into this output here with the adapter that I just showed you, the noise floor goes up even a little bit more, which is one reason why I was able to figure out the, uh, that there's a difference in gain between these outputs beyond the fact that, you know, you have to adjust the attenuator too. Okay, but so that is there. It almost never gets in the way of music though that I could hear and like that noise floor completely disappears on harder to drive loads. Um, and I didn't notice it on speakers either. So just on the really, just be careful on really sensitive, easy drive headphones um, with this thing because of that noise floor. Now, that said, when music actually starts playing, this seems to have a very dark sonic background. So 
my personal highest end headphone amp is the Vioelectric HPA V281, and it has a very quiet sonic background too. But this is actually even quieter than that one. So that's, um, that's a mark in this favor. Now, the sound presentation here is, I want to say slightly W shaped. Okay. Now, again, I, I mentioned that I have the HPA V281 as my personal high-end headphone amp right now. And I don't have the market context knowledge of high-end headphone amps um, to the extent that I do with high-end headphones, right? I'm just not as familiar there. So I don't have as many comparison points for this one and all that. Um, so all I can do is tell you how this compares to things that I have heard, and I don't necessarily know how well it compares to um, lateral moves in terms of you know other amps at the price point. But I can make some educated guesses, which I will share here in a moment as well. So now, in terms of its presentation, it is somewhat relaxed and smooth in its sonic presentation. And it took me a while to realize that because looking around at the amps that I have, like that Vio that I just mentioned... I have um, the shit Asgard 3. I have, for a speaker amp, I have the Adcom GFA555 Mark II. And, like, all of those things, like, I just noticed that I tend towards warmer, smoother, more relaxed presentation amps. And then I tend to pair those with really incisive DACs, like my Berkeley Audio Designs Alpha S2, which fed this most of the time or uh, even the Chord Hugo 2, when used as just a DAC, is very neutral and incisive in its presentation. So that's just kind of the way that I've leaned. I noticed that this one was... Like, it so it took me a while to register that this one was also a bit more warm and smooth in its presentation. And it wasn't until I just very recently reacquired a Lake People G111 headphone amp, which is more forward and aggressive in its presentation. And I listened to that, and then listen to this, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, this one is relaxed and smooth, and I need to say that. So there, I've said it. Okay, but now back to that, um, the presentation, the sound signature, it, it's a slight W to me. The low end, now I don't actually know if these things are elevated, although I think the mids might be just a slight bit, but like the low end is really taut, really tight, really controlled, nice and punchy. There's also lots of control and cleanliness up in the treble. Like, I very rarely ever heard sibilance from this amplifier, even on headphones that can tend towards sibilance, like my DT880 or the HE1000 V2, okay, those kinds of things. Okay, so real good control in the top end, too. I do think that there is a slight emphasis somewhere near the middle of the mid-range, I don't know exactly where it is in frequencies, but like when I go from my Vio amp and then I switch over to this one, I can it just feels like the mids come forward just a tiny little bit. Okay, not a lot, not enough to trip up my own uh, mid sensitivity that I talk about frequently. And again, I do a hearing quirks video, or I have one where I explain all of the hearing quirks that I am aware of, and that is my least watched video so far. But I put a link to it in the description of all of my videos, so please check that out. But anyway, this amp really, even though it does have a slight mid-forwardness like compared to the other amps that I just named, doesn't seem to mess with my mid-sensitivity much at all. So I think that is also good. All right. Um, so as far as like unique sonic features, I think that's um, where it is. Like, uh, And again, this did the most of the work when I was playing with top of the line headphones. So when I talked about the quality of staging and spatial presentation of those headphones, like that also speaks to the high quality of staging and spatial presentation of this. Very good um, imaging, very good separation, a good sense of depth, okay? Um, and the soundstage size seems to be left mostly to the transducer. Like I don't really think that this changes the soundstage size. Sound stage size. I struggle with that phrase. Sound say that on other headphones, right? Or or on on other pieces of gear. Now, using it as a speaker amp, 
I used it to drive my ELAC UB52s, which I reviewed. I'll put a link to that down in the description as well, um, which are not particularly sensitive. They are 6 ohm impedance, but I think only 85 decibel sensitivity or something like that. And this drove them in a near field setting on my desktop really well. And it was a noticeable step up in sonic performance from my Parasound Zonamp V3, which I normally use as the speaker amp on my desk. Okay, so, I mean, it's quite a big step up in speaker amp performance there, even on, you know, those 700 pair ELACs, which are excellent speakers at $700. They really are, but they're still $700 speakers, and this is a $4,500 amp, so it's, there's an imbalance there in level of, of quality, but even with those speakers, I could tell that this was up a couple notches higher, at least in overall quality, over that Parasound Zone Amp V3, which is already an excellent little amplifier. Okay. So that's what I can say about its, its sound. Um, and again, I somewhat lack context to show, to tell you like, where does this fit in the market context of amplifiers? Now, it is a bit unique in terms of its all-in-one approach. Like it is a speaker amp. It is also a headphone amp, like, or a speaker amp that they put nice headphone taps on. Okay, um, I'm not aware of too many other of those, okay? Um, there is the, the, the shit Ragnarok, which is much cheaper than this, I think. Um, and so this is probably a different level of performance than that, okay? But at the same time, like, if you're looking, if you're looking for a headphone amp and you have $4,500 to spend, first of all, congratulations. Secondly, uh... I don't know if this is where you want to go for that strict purpose. I get the sense that for $4,500, you can get a better headphone amp. For $4,500, are you going to get a better all-in-one package that does well with speakers, can handle ribbon headphones, and is, is pretty good? It's, it is all around an improvement as a headphone amp over my Vio V281. I'm just not convinced that the level of increase over that for strictly headphones is worth the 1800-ish dollar price difference in MSRPs between what the Vio was when it was in its day and what this sells for under its normal pricing. Okay, um at the sale price, maybe. Maybe. Okay? But it is better all around as a headphone amp than my Vio V281, noticeably so. Okay, just does it align with the price? I don't know. But then you throw in that this does sound really good with speakers as well, and it can save you some desk or rack space by being a high-quality all-in-one unit, and then the picture changes a little bit, I think, and this becomes a more attractive product there. Also, that becomes true if you have one of the few ribbon models out there that needs a more of a current drive, you know, an amp that can handle really low impedance loads out there, like the SR1A, although I, th I think the MySphere might also be in that category. And you'll void the warranty, so I'm not telling you to do this, but if you are one of the few owners of the Odyssey LCDR, okay, the Jotunheim A is a good amp. Didn't really have a problem with it, but I think it was holding back the LCDR a little bit, and so this could help out with that, as well as drive your desk speakers and be a really solid headphone amp to go along with it. You could use this as your normal two-channel system amp, too, if you have more sensitive speakers from Klipsch or Tekton or um, who makes the Zoo, one of those other Utah-based speaker companies, because there are hundreds of those, it seems. Okay, um, but anyway, yeah. So in in terms of that being an all-in-one package, I think really attractive. So there it is. I'll sum it up. You get an all-in-one amplifier that's pretty good for speakers. Does really well with ribbon headphones, um, and also pretty well with conventional headphones. In an all-in-one package, a warm smooth, relaxed kind of uh, presentation, maybe just a touch of W to the sound signature, although I don't think too many people are going to be bothered by that at all. And just good bass punch and control, really good control up in the upper treble as well. And uh, yeah, 
Okay, I mean, the only weakness is maybe that noise floor for really sensitive headphones. Okay, that's not the greatest of match. And then just from an ergonomic standpoint, for some people, a 24-step attenuator is not going to be quite enough volume control. They're going to want something between the 24 steps, but that doesn't bother everyone also. Okay, so uh, I will go ahead and leave it there. So I'm going to post this as soon as I can once I realize that that sale was going on. Normally a $4,500 US dollar unit on sale for the month of November here in 2021 for $3,750. So if you're looking at this, now is probably the time to make a move on it. Now, RAL has made no contact with me at all. Um, they have said nothing. So this is free advertising for them. This was loaned to me by a third party. So they have no part in me saying, hey, this is on sale, okay? Anyway, so there you go, Ral. You're welcome for that free advertising. I am Wave Theory. Thanks for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to my channel. And as always, enjoy the music.